As some of you might remember, a few months ago, I had a reporter from Al Jazeera English reach out to me to ask if I would like to participate in a story he'd like to do about my work and the work of other atheist YouTubers. After a long conversation with him, I decided that based on the people he wanted to involve in the story and the things that he wanted to make sure were said on the platform, I thought this seemed like a good opportunity to kind of get the message out there. I also thought at the time, you know, if this gets some new people interested in my content, it might be a good opportunity to shine a light on a community that needs to be spoken about more, which Al Jazeera probably wouldn't speak about. The story finally aired just a few days ago, and don't get me wrong, I am very grateful for them for being willing to put me on their platform and even paint me in a sympathetic light, but the story of atheists pushing back against religion in the US and elsewhere is not just a story of ex-Christians like myself. Ex-Muslims are a huge part of this too. So that's why I've asked my friend apostate Aladdin to come on and share his perspective as he and I respond to and comment on the story from Al Jazeera English. Hello everyone, my name is Apostate Aladdin. I am an ex-Muslim and I talk about my experiences with Islam and leaving the religion on my YouTube channel. Uh, I also use my platform to give a voice to ex-Muslims who are very underrepresented in the media. And that kind of ties into why we're talking today. Drew McCoy is one of hundreds of thousands of Americans making a living on YouTube. He might look like a typical millennial YouTuber, but the nature of his videos are a little different. I feel like this one could get me in hot water. When McCoy, better known as genetically modified skeptic, turns the mic on, the content can be controversial and to some, highly offensive. The very idea of a Christian Bible was invented by a flawed human being. If you're going to hell in every religion, I definitely want to hear about why. Without sufficient reason to believe Christianity was true though, I had to leave all of that behind. When I became an atheist, I couldn't tell anyone because that would mean that I was not only rejecting their personal Lord and Savior, but I was maybe even rejecting them as individuals. That is how my evangelical community would have taken it. Yeah, I'm really glad that they were willing to keep that in and say that, you know, I couldn't talk to anybody about this uh, because American culture does not really, or at least American evangelical culture doesn't want people to uh, to speak out against it or at least even differ from it. So it's nice that some kind of mainstream media would be willing to depict that. Uh, that said, if it were an ex-Muslim in the same situation, which I understand that many ex-Muslims are in similar situations, including in the US, but also in other places, uh, I, I'm not sure that many mainstream media outlets, possibly particularly, probably particularly Al Jazeera, would be willing to portray this positively. Like, what, what's your take on the kind of the comparison between what American ex-Christians might experience versus what uh, like ex-Muslims might experience? Well, to start off, the fact that possibly the first two words in this video were your full name was shocking to me. If you were to tell me that someone is broadcasting my full name on a news piece about speaking about atheism, uh, I'd be terrified. So that's just to paint a picture as to how different it is for it to be for someone to be an atheist in America uh, coming from a Christian religion versus a Muslim religion. One thing that caught my eye is that the title of this video is God and Atheism on YouTube. At first, I thought, given the content of the video, that they'd be specifically talking about the U.S., but it doesn't seem to be titled that way. So if their goal was to cover atheism on YouTube, they've got a very narrow view of what that is. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not just uh, ex-Christians talking about this. I mean, ex-Muslims have been, and and many other people who have always been atheists or people coming from other religions, that's always been a thing. I think that ex-Christians maybe have the most societal power and um, ability to be open about these kinds of things, but they're far from the only people who actually talk about atheism on YouTube, right? Yeah, and, and I understand that they might be the biggest group or maybe the first group even to, to do it because um, I believe that they were the first to be able to get away with it. 
uh, like their the laws in the countries where they live allow for it and the people are more receptive to it even though there was more resistance to that kind of thing in the media in the past uh, that that resistance rarely came in the form of violence or um, some kind of legislation against the person exercising their free speech but that is something that doesn't exist in many countries in the world uh, regardless of what religion they practice but it is especially frowned upon in countries where Muslims are the majority uh, population. Yeah, definitely. And it's the, the sad reality of this. And I'm, I'm extremely grateful to the journalist, Ryan, who reached out to me and, and conducted this thing and uh, was a ultimately able to orchestrate having Al Jazeera talk about atheism in a way that was positive. But when it comes to talking about issues of religion on on in the world stage, I'm not sure if that's something, well, no, honestly, I don't think that's something that they'd really be willing to do, especially in, like, w would you ever be featured <laughs> by, like, Al Jazeera here? I highly doubt it, and if I were to be, I'd have to actually seriously consider uh, whether I want to do such a thing. I mean, it would be great for the cause, but at the same time, it would be super dangerous. It would get a lot more attention on me than I initially intended. If Al Jazeera were to cover uh, the story of an ex-Muslim or the rising atheism in the Middle East or in the Muslim world, I think that would be a hotter story and it would get a lot more clicks for them than this kind of video. I mean, um, not to discredit what you do in any way, but compared to ex-Muslims talking about the religion in ways that are not favorable, uh, ex-Christians doing it is almost kind of old news in terms of, you know, the, the media news cycle. So this would be beneficial for them to cover more of our stories as well. Yeah, I totally agree. Tip for you guys. What's your next story? There you go. I mean, yeah, I, right. I, I, could, I could pitch a few ideas. I was raised independent, fundamental Baptist. That meant that we believed that the end times were near, that the earth was created in six literal days by God about 6,000 years ago. Some of the things that I was taught, I started to question. I didn't have anyone in real life to talk to about issues of religion and atheism. So I decided that maybe I could go online and express myself freely if that was really the only place I could do it. Until next time, everyone, keep an open mind and stay skeptical. Drew is certainly not alone. He's part of a wider community of atheists in the United States who found a sanctuary on YouTube. I'm John Gleason, the Godless Engineer. There's a slew of popular channels with millions of viewers dedicated exclusively to articulating the atheist worldview. I don't think it's knowable if a god exists. And challenging religious narratives for the approximately 10% of Americans that openly identify as non-believers. If religious people want us to believe in God, then the burden of proof is on them. In the US, most atheist YouTubers have a very similar origin story. They were once ardent believers and grew up in strict Christian communities. Now they feel compelled to defend their godless worldview, often in the face of great adversity. Yeah, again, I see them saying things that are true. I'm, again, very grateful that they're willing to show all of the, a bunch of atheist YouTubers who are talking about these things. Um, and I would say that the majority of atheist YouTubers do have a background of uh, being raised in more conservative Christian communities. However, if we're talking about, like you said earlier, about atheism online, and even in America, we're not just talking about ex-Christians. There are other voices who have, you know, some agreement with perspectives like mine, but also have unique experiences that I think make those voices especially valuable. Uh, how do you feel about the phrasing of that when the reporter said that they want to defend their godless worldview? Is that pretty much what got you into it? Is, is that your motivation for doing it? Uh, I'm glad that you brought that up because I think that that was one of my like kind of eh, moments when, when watching it was just hearing the phrase because that that phrase is borrowed from um, Christian culture. We call it Christianese here in the U.S. It paints it like what the point of all of this is, is kind of parallel to what Christians do, which is we want to spread the good news of, in this case, godlessness, you know, and, and no, uh, that's, that's not really what the point is. I mean, 
if I'm to influence people, if people are going to change their minds based on watching my content, then fine. Um, that's uh, in some cases I can consider that a good thing. In other cases, it's just neutral. Uh, but no, my primary goal, like I do say later on in their piece, is I just want people to not feel like they're alone and and like they're crazy for feeling this way in a country where we're still the minority. Uh, but I'm wondering about you though. Do you do you talk about your experiences with Islam and and talk about you know secularism and atheism because you're trying to like make converts for atheism and share your godless worldview? No, and and I actually often stay away from talking about my views about the existence of God because I find them almost irrelevant to what we're talking about. Um, because what I care about is why people believe in a specific God and how that affects other people, namely the ones who don't believe in that specific God. So it's not really about uh, defending or sharing my worldview to spread it uh, in a way. It's basically to defend people who have said godless worldview, not actually the view itself. People who come out of a, especially a dogmatic, fundamentalist, high control faith, they come out and they've got a real fire in their belly and they look for an outlet. And YouTube provides that. But if you want to read a book to really make you an atheist, I'm going to recommend the Bible. You can have the long form exchange. You can develop a relationship with the viewer. If you see a debate show like the atheist experience, they welcome religious people to call in and they challenge them directly. Over 75% of all scholars and, and historians can agree that Jesus of Nazareth was a real person. Well, okay, so first right? first of all, 93% of all statistics are pulled right out of somebody's <laughs> at the time that they need to use them. The types of interactions you get will vary based on the type of channel that it is. Street epistemology will get just the curious. <laughs> um, do you have like five minutes to just have a conversation yeah. about God? Sure. I am most interested in what I call kind of the seekers. So just like Seth was saying, I, I do relate with that having an opinion and having this um, this passionate need to talk about it. And when I went to YouTube, or not necessarily just to talk about it, to hear it echoed somewhere else. And when I went to YouTube, what I came across were uh, channels like Matt Delahunty's, and um, that was a huge turnoff for me from the whole atheism thing. And in fact, it actually held me back many years because I thought that you have two options, either you are religious or you are a jerk to people who are religious and there's no in between. And there was sometimes enjoyment in finding people who had the same ideas as you, but the execution was never really the same. I mean, at the end of the day, if I am to point and laugh at believers for having beliefs that I deem to be too ridiculous or too stupid, I don't feel any more um, of a community once I'm done doing so. I'm just left alone with a bunch of bullies who just want to make fun of people. And it doesn't help me or people like me feel safety or community or feel like we're actually heard. We just feel like we're shouting at the other side. My only experience with Atheist YouTube before becoming an atheist myself was actually seeing a really old, uh, amazing atheist like TJ Kirk video from, I don't know, 2011 or something. I was a kid when I saw that. And yeah, it was someone shouting at a camera. I was very turned off by that. And I had been taught that this is how atheists were. So seeing my one and only video of an atheist that I'd ever seen just confirming that definitely entrenched me further in my, in my uh, godly worldview, let's say. Uh, and I think that that is why First of all, that's one of the reasons why I value what you do so much, and I, I think that it is a more valuable approach. Uh, I want people to realize that, yes, while their anger is valid and that may be a place to start, if you stay there, you don't have long-term benefit from it. Anger can definitely motivate you, but if that motivation is just ending in you mocking, ridiculing, yelling, feeling superior, like you said, you're not going to develop a community that's healthy. You, you might actually inspire a community that is people that eventually will be at each other's throats, not just at the throats of, you know, believers.
And I also didn't identify that strongly with the whole debate around the existence of God or, you know, atheism as a concept, as uh, the positive assertion that there is no God. That meant a lot less to me. And I still don't even know if I believe that there is no God. But that argument meant a lot less to me than the arguments about a specific religion that I follow and about what happens to people who don't want to or don't believe that religion, don't want to follow it anymore. Uh, I felt alienated even within such atheist uh, groups because it didn't seem like they were there to support me or they didn't even care about my cause. All they cared about was whether they were right or wrong about whether God exists or not, at least um, as much as they can argue it. But on the other hand, I really enjoyed videos from channels like Street Epistemology because they focused on how people have their beliefs, how people form their beliefs and why they hold on to them and how you can change someone's mind or allow them to change their own mind if just they stop and think about their beliefs. And that resonated with me a lot more than all the debates surrounding the existence of God. I can see people seeing this part and go, wait a minute, but you do call and show stuff. So you're just contradicting yourself right now. I'm going to go ahead and step in and say that the approach that you take with people is a lot more conversational and less about you being like right and the person on the other end of the line just completely agreeing with your like metaphysical positions or whatever and and more about them being kind of open to entertaining uh, what the thoughts or experiences of others might be and how they can orient themselves to be tolerant of that? I mean, am I on the right track there in describing what you do? Yeah. And I was expecting you to play devil's advocate and actually ask me the question and, and make an accusation there. But uh, you, you pretty much said what's on my mind. Um, I don't try to corner a person, ridicule them and humiliate them into admitting that their belief is wrong. I try to get them to keep talking about their belief till either they see a problem in what they're saying, or at least they can see why someone like me might not see eye to eye with them. And if their conclusion at the end of the day is that um, Aladdin seems like a sincere person, but he's somehow not able to believe what I believe, even though I've explained it to them, maybe Aladdin doesn't deserve to go to hell forever over his conclusion. One belief that is very hard for Muslims to shake off is that those who leave Islam or those who know intimately of Islam and don't follow it are doing so because of a conscious decision to disobey and disagree with it because they have made a choice because they want to go to hell. And after such a conversation, the other person can at least see that I am coming from a position of empathy, from a position of understanding, and that I am not the stereotype of a disbeliever that they expected to meet. Right. I think that that can go really far in moderating the beliefs that people have. I mean, I, I think that you and I ultimately agree that the important part of what people are calling deconstructing their faith now is, is not doubting the metaphysical system necessarily. It's not being like, okay, there's no God done. One of my friends says this specific thing that like everybody in my friend group tends to quote, if you deconstruct your religion and you come away with all of the same social attitudes as you had before you deconstructed your religion, you just now don't believe in God, you didn't deconstruct any of the important parts. <laughs> That's very well said. I found that these conversations with believers help them learn more about themselves and help me also learn about uh, how I used to believe in. And it helps humanize them at the same time to the listeners and to me and anyone participating in the conversation. Because once people let their guard down and it stops being about who's trying to win the argument or the debate, um, they can really learn from what they're saying. They can actually reflect on their own beliefs and their own thoughts. And sometimes they don't necessarily leave with a different conclusion about God but they leave with a different conclusion about some other beliefs that fall under religion or um, habits or culture or whatever else that they've learned and adopted without actually deeply thinking about it. And I think that goes both ways. It doesn't just mean that once you have left a religion that you've fully deconstructed how you think about that religion and how you think about yourself. Um, and it doesn't mean that because you've left a religion, you're more self-aware than someone who follows a religion. So it really helps to shine a spotlight on yourself in that kind of conversation and see what you can learn from it. 
I was a believer for a long time and I don't know. I've got doubts, but I just Googled atheist and your channel popped up. They needed to find this online community because they don't have the people around them who understand their experiences. The American religion is faith in faith. And so people who don't believe anything, they're scary to a lot of Americans, particularly American Christians. Where a state is dominated by Christians, that's where it's harder to be an atheist. You may not be able to tell your family because it might not be safe. You might lose your job. So it is difficult to be an atheist in much of America. Except online, where YouTube has provided a diverse space for atheist thought, you can pick and choose the style and tone of content. In the early days, however, it was a space dominated by predominantly snarky white men who ridiculed religion and the religious, a tone largely set by the so-called new atheists, thought leaders like Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins. Obviously, I do not share your beliefs, and I think you are hallucinating. A celestial North Korea. <laughs> Who wants this to be true? They inspired a new generation of non-believers, deploying blistering debate tactics that were soon emulated by YouTubers. In recent years, those tactics have shifted. So when you Google atheism and Islam, you would probably get a lot of um, debates about Islam and slam dunks and all sorts of hot takes, uh, but you wouldn't really come across people like me who are trying to actually give it um, a human spin, so to speak. And that is one of the reasons why I started my YouTube channel, because when I tried to find people like me or when I tried to find more information about my position uh, or people in my position, I did not like what I saw and I didn't feel represented. And that's part of why I do what I do. So if you want to help us, please do give more attention to those who are trying to earnestly talk about the topic and not just score points or, you know, um, not just the clickbaity titles about the topic. I'm not sure how much Ryan, the journalist here, was lifting this little segment from things that I discuss in our interview that he didn't um, necessarily include. Uh, because, yeah, I, I do think that early atheist YouTube um, was really just kind of imitating people who were scoring points. And on YouTube, it became maybe especially about scoring points for a lot of people. and. There have always been people on on YouTube who have been doing something better than just that, but they are they've rarely historically been the most popular channels. Um, and so, something that I also try to do is do something that's hopefully a step above or beyond that, and uh, and just introduce this human element. I can't say that my titles are not or thumbnails are not always uh, inflammatory because sometimes they very much are. But I try to make uh, my my content and videos a little bit of a Trojan horse for, oh man, I wanted a bitter fight and oh no, instead I'm being being educated and I'm seeing a human, uh, the human element of this whole thing and thinking about people's individual experiences rather than just thinking about how stupid people who disagree with me are. <laughs> Yeah, I'll give you a pass for that because I, I tend to do that as well, where I would have a title or a thumbnail that is meant to be clickbaity in the sense that would get the extremists from both sides and would sort of disappoint both of them, but show them something else, not what they were expecting. And I think that's a very valid way to reach the other side. As long as you're not actually misleading them about the content of the video, it, I'm sure it's usually a clever spin on something that you're actually talking about. So yeah, you get a pass from me for that. Not that you're looking for a pass, but. What do you think about this idea of people being inspired by the Four Horsemen historically, like in, in atheist circles? Because I know that there are a lot of ex-Muslims who uh, sought or found a lot of inspiration in the words of like the God delusion having been translated to Arabic, like. And, and selling millions of copies or being downloaded millions of times and people liking Christopher Hitchens and being willing to speak out against Islam and, and things like that. What's, what's your take on all that? So when I was first exposed to atheism on YouTube, it was mostly those uh, sorts of videos by the Four Horsemen. And they didn't really resonate with me much because on one hand, it was fulfilling this uh, this prophecy or this warning that the outsiders or the others are trying to lure you off the straight path. 
And here I'm seeing a stereotypically uh, white foreign man talking about my religion or talking about God in general in the exact way that I was warned it was going to happen. So out of no fault of their own, the speakers, uh, I was repulsed by that kind of uh, video. And at the same time, I felt like I couldn't relate to them on a human level because we don't look the same, we don't talk the same way, we don't live in the same area. And I was very sad that even when I found someone who can sort of relate to what I'm saying uh, somewhat, they're so far away, they are nothing like me, and it still didn't feel like representation or hope for me or community. Um, and there was certainly a lot of snobbiness and, and snarkiness in the way that they talk, and that's very off-putting to both uh, believers and a lot of ex-believers like myself. I find myself conflicted about the Four Horsemen a lot of the time because I agree very much with everything that you've just said, and obviously the the approach that I take is close to being in opposition of a lot of the things that they've they've said. You know, I've openly and proudly contradicted Richard Dawkins and said that he's basically religiously illiterate. <laughs> uh, however, I'm not sure if. And my commenters have said this many times, and I don't think they're wrong. If they had not basically flung the doors open, then the possibility is there that I would not be able to do the channel that I'm doing now without greater persecution or alienation or or something like that. Um, my commenters will say, you have to realize they were speaking in a time when no matter how they spoke about religion, if it was not in praise of like American Christianity, then they would be lambasted and thought to be all of these horrible things. So they might as well just like give the most scathing uh, criticism they possibly can because any criticism is going to be seen just as, 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 as just as scathing. Uh, I, I see that to a certain extent, but at the same time, I don't think that negates the fact that People like you, and I didn't watch The Four Horsemen before I was an atheist at all, but I think people like me, if I would have been in your situation, would be turned off by their approach. Uh, so I I don't know. Are there as many shades of gray here as I'm kind of perceiving? Yes, and their role was not to actually speak to everyone all the time, you know, from all sorts of backgrounds. I think they did their role well, and I don't think that I could have done it better or anything. I just think that they've, like you said, paved the way for something new and in a way something better in many contexts. I don't think it was part of their intention to reach out specifically to ex-Muslims who didn't know that they're uh, not alone. But because of my circumstances, I am able to do what they couldn't or what they weren't trying to do uh, in, a, in a much better way. And I'm grateful that they've sort of paved the way for all this to happen. I relate to a lot of what Chrissy was saying about uh, believers having faith in faith. I've seen the same thing in uh, Muslim circles as well. And I relate to some of the stakes that she was talking about, the stakes of people finding out about your atheism, except they feel a lot more amplified in the Muslim world, unfortunately, which is why I'm wearing a mask and which is why you don't know my full name. In recent years, those tactics have shifted. Seth Andrews witnessed the evolution. He was there from the beginning. The temperature of atheist activism back then was a lot more mockery of religion. You know, Jesus is Santa Claus for adults. and You need to grow up and accept reality. Because Christianity is just a cult and it's not true. No oh, the Bible is the imperfect word of man. It's divinely inspired. I think a lot of us had the delusion that you can mock people out of their faith. But if you can make them feel safe, and if they make me feel safe, that's when conversations begin. And I think online atheism and activism, I think we sort of woke up to that. You need to be able to have good faith conversations uh, with, with people who don't share your non-belief. Uh, you need to have a more nuanced understanding of religion. If you would rather not question essential parts of your faith, that's your prerogative. But don't paint others as unreasonable or immoral for being open to questioning theirs. One of my missions, one of my goals now, has become to make content that, while not pulling punches when I'm criticizing religion, I am taking a tone that someone's mom would be able to listen to and maybe even resonate with. 
I want to be so clearly compassionate and so clearly human in what I'm saying that it's impossible to dehumanize me. To me, everything that I said there and everything that they presented everybody as saying is, you know, just is totally in line with things that you've said about your own goals and approach. But I wish that I heard you say that line before I started my YouTube channel, because even though I try to model that approach, um, I've never heard it put that way that succinctly before. Uh, so kudos for that. Something that I wanted to say about uh, mockery of religion. The thing with Islam is it's a very delicate topic to talk about because anything said about Islam that is not praising it is perceived as mockery of the religion. And it's perceived exactly the same as that video of someone putting on a whiny voice and making fun of a believer about what they believe. And unfortunately, that's one of the biggest barriers for platforming us because I imagine Al Jazeera wouldn't want to platform someone who has left the religion of Islam who might have at any point said anything negative about Islam because that is perceived as Al Jazeera attacking Muslims for their belief and attacking the religion as a whole. And given that their headquarters is in the Middle East, I imagine that that would be a conflict of interest or something that they don't wouldn't want to uh, um, get involved in. Like you said earlier, this would be a huge story for them, but I think that people would view it very negatively um, at the same time. Maybe their main viewer base could see it very negatively. I can very much relate to what you said in that there were people, primarily older people when I was growing up, that if they heard anything said about Christianity that was not directly praising it, uh, they saw that as inappropriate, even mockery. And yeah, it made it to where they couldn't hear anything. They couldn't hear any perspective outside of their own without perceiving that as some sort of threat to them. But I think that that is a mentality that while that does exist in the Christian world, it seems to exist in the Muslim world a lot more uniformly, a lot more widespread. I don't know. Would you say that that's the case? Yeah, no, absolutely. And um it's a lot more unapologetically said that someone who makes such a blasphemous claim about the religion deserves a lot of bad things to happen to them. And it's not uncommon to see campaigns shared almost in a grassroots sort of way to find docs and, and bring that person to what you know the, the masses think is justice. Um, so it is very scary to criticize Islam openly in a, in a Muslim country. And I had a question for you, since your approach is being very obviously compassionate and very human in how you relay your thoughts, I try to do the same thing, but at the same time, I do include an element of satire, not when I'm talking to a believer, not in the same conversation where I could upset someone by uh, by satirizing their belief, but just to discuss the belief itself. I have my own videos talking about certain stories in the religion and certain situations, and I try to play them out to demonstrate how sometimes if, if you laugh at a belief, you're more likely to think critically about it. But since that can be perceived as mockery and hostile towards believers, do you think that I'm shooting myself in the foot by taking both approaches at the same time? With some people, with certain people, undoubtedly, yes. However, the satire, I think, can be a very, very powerful tool in allowing people who wouldn't necessarily be interested in just hearing about your experiences or talking to you directly or whatever to also receive some kind of your input uh, on the subject. The community that I grew up in would not have been willing to speak to an atheist after they identified themselves. They were not to be associated with, go away unless you want to hear the gospel, and I'm going to just tell you and you're going to agree with it. I don't want to have a conversation with you. However, many people in the church would have been willing to watch Monty Python do sketches where they are lambasting Christianity in a kind of very unapologetic way. And they would just whistle along to look on the bright side of life at the same time. Some people view satire very differently than actually speaking to uh, a person or some people are, are willing to put up their walls and not listen to anything that a person is directly telling them. But through the lens of satire, they're able to reframe their perspective a little bit and, and understand. I also do satire in a way. I mean, I've made a video about how to go to hell in every religion. And people have said, 
why would you make this? This is so horrible. Like, do you, do you not care about people's eternal souls? And the, the point of it is to bring you in with a provocative premise, educate you, and ultimately make this idea that everyone deserves to, you know, end up in hell regardless of what they've done or unless they believe specific things is absurd. And when you put hell beliefs next to each other and you view this in a global context, they all look just kind of as meaningful or meaningless as any other. So I, I can't knock your satire when I'm doing it too. If some viewers consider that kind of satire that you do to be too far, then I think that demonstrates that no matter what you do, someone's going to be unhappy with your approach. Because um, that seems very mild to me. And like you said, very to the point about the, the point of um, putting all these religions next to each other and all these beliefs about hell in a row. Um, and it's interesting that it's actually flipped in the Muslim world. I think that people will be less likely to engage with satirical content than they would be to actually talk to an atheist because there's this hard limit on any depictions of religious uh, characters in Islam. So if that depiction is also, I mean, that depiction is always assumed to be offensive or intended to offend. So people tend to not watch that unless they're looking to be offended, which is also part of why I do it, not to offend people, but it draws in the kind of crowd who's primed to be offended and expecting um, a hateful mockery of their religion only to see that I'm using these depictions as a tool to tell a story rather than just to make someone feel bad. But it's unfortunate that in Islam, it's the depiction itself that is considered a crime, even if you're using it for a good reason. Um, so that certainly sets a barrier. But I also like that I can demonstrate both sides of it. I can show them that the same person who's making satirical content about the religion is actually kind of a nice guy when he's talking to you about your belief. Um, so it helps shatter this idea that the enemy is just unidimensionally evil and they deserve all the hate that they get. Around the election of Donald Trump, a lot of us saw that talking about secularism with compassion, with kindness, was so necessary if we wanted to mend the relationships that were constantly being broken by the division in our country. That was the way that was actually going to get things done. I think that that attitude of compassion over vitriol has won out overall when it comes to atheist YouTube culture today. If you place your left hand on the Bay of Bible and raise your right hand... And... Some American atheists may be softening their approach to fight for a pluralistic society. But it's an uphill battle in a country that's not only a majority Christian nation, that I will faithfully execute, but affords Christianity a certain privilege, a higher political calling. So help you God? So help me God. And one element with outsized political influence in recent years is Christian nationalism. This fringe ideology insists that the U.S. is a Christian nation, one that should be governed by biblical principles, despite a clear separation of church and state in the Constitution. This movement is now a central target for atheists on YouTube. This is something that we must fight. And I have joined not just other atheists, but people of other religions and even Christians. So you're a Christian, but you and I join in being critics and sounding the alarms about Christian nationalists. Absolutely, we are allies in this cause. I'm not an enemy of Christians. I am surrounded by Christians, and they are, in many cases, the most important people in my life. I will fight for someone's right to be religious. When I engage is when they claim that the nation belongs to them. So it's funny that they bring up Trump because around the time that Trump was elected, I got more active on Facebook in discussions and debates in the comments section defending Muslims and Islam because of all the comments that Trump had made about um, banning Muslims from entering the country which I've always thought was ridiculous. And it wasn't even what he was actually doing. He was just banning a list of countries. But regardless, he drummed up a lot of support and a lot of hate rhetoric against Muslims, which made me instinctively go to the comments of these articles and have discussions with people about it. And I was doing it not because of my strong faith. I was still a believer at the time, but I was driven by identity and 
community. I felt like my people were under attack and I felt that if I don't defend them and if I don't defend myself, soon enough we'll be the, the enemy that's vilified in the media. And those sorts of discussions exposed me to a lot of different points of view and a lot of talking points that um, non-Muslims had to use against Muslims. And they weren't super effective at getting me to change my faith. But over time, some of what I was exposed to actually got me thinking. And I started thinking about all the ways that I would defend their religion instinctively uh, without any formal training or without any um, nefarious motivation to do so. Um, but it could have been one of the initial steps that got me to where I am now, weirdly enough. When it comes to ex-Christian atheist YouTube, I definitely think that the election of Trump uh, was a catalyst. A lot of people were saying that atheist YouTube was already over and that it ended in 2015 or so. Uh, but then a bunch of new atheist channels popped up on YouTube around 2016, 2017, including mine. And whether we acknowledge it or not, I think it was just a response to the division that we were seeing. And so, yeah, I, I can say that, like I said in the interview, that was a some sort of motivating factor for me. Uh, touching on the Christian nationalism bit, that is motivating to me for sure. And I think a lot of my viewers are very concerned about Christian nationalism. I even see some people saying that, you know, we are just a step away from being completely overtaken and basically becoming Christian Saudi Arabia. Um, I don't know that we're actually that close. It is a very serious problem, and I don't want to turn into the Handmaid's Tale. But if we're talking about countries like Saudi Arabia, like Iran, um, even Qatar, uh, I don't know that we're actually all that close to that. Uh, <laughs> I know that ex-Muslims will speak about, I know that you, you do less so, but ex-Muslims do uh, often, semi-often speak about the fact that theocracy is just kind of an accepted thing in parts of the, of the Muslim world. Yeah, though I don't think the U.S. is headed for that anytime soon either. I don't just talk about um, incidents and uh, problems that Muslims face in the most restrictive Muslim areas because it distracts from the fact that we face issues in every environment, including uh, in the U.S. as ex-Muslims. So it can be a distraction to think just about the extreme cases and just be comfortable as long as we don't get to that point. That is something that I'm glad that they focused on here. It's not just that we're, you know, atheists might speak up because we're afraid that maybe one day a Christian government will gain this institutional power and start executing us or something. There are problems right now. I mean, the, the U.S. Is, is nowhere near something like Saudi Arabia, but that doesn't erase the fact that there are problems of discrimination and marginalization that need to be dealt with at this very moment with the political system that we have right now. So Seth was talking about uh, not being an enemy of Christians, and I relate to that in a lot of ways. In fact, I actually have Muslim callers sometimes who tell me that they're comfortable speaking to me uh, because of my approach and the way that I handle conversations, despite knowing very clearly that I don't believe in Islam and I even satirize it sometimes. So a lot of Muslims don't consider me to be an enemy. But if you go by what the scripture says and what the religious position should be, I am the de facto enemy of Islam because not only am I having pleasant conversations with Muslims that might humanize ex-Muslims and normalize this idea of leaving the religion, which would be detrimental to Islam, uh, but I also say things that I'm not supposed to say as a Muslim, and that makes me an enemy by default. So unfortunately, it's a bit harder to present myself as not to the enemy of Islam because that's the position I've been put in. But I'm hoping to slowly demonstrate that it doesn't have to be that way. One of my goals, as I've alluded to and I said directly in this piece, is to not portray myself as, as the enemy of Christians and in fact make content that would be digestible to someone's mom. In an ex-Christian context, the primary people that you have problems with, the like marginalization that you experience primarily comes from your parents. Um, that that's where it, it really is is coming from. So I've had people email me and say that they wanted to 
discuss their position with their parents. They wanted to say this or that. And when trying to come up with resources that their parents could potentially look into uh, to understand their child better, all they had was people making fun of people that were like their parents. So of course you're not going to share that. Uh, so my goal there was to make content that fills that need that someone in a position like like mine with my parents could just whip out a video and go, hey, this guy says something that I resonate with and he says it nicely. He's not trying to make fun of you. He's just trying to get this across. Um, and Atheist YouTube has been slowly trudging forward to the point where I think that there are a lot more videos now that have a similar approach, similar goal. And I was wondering if you see something similar in the evolution of ex-Muslim content on YouTube too. So I'm only going to speak about the English uh, speaking side of it. In terms of the English ex-Muslim content on YouTube, uh, the content that I was exposed to when I first started looking into the topic was a lot more harsh and cynical, and it was not the kind of thing that you can show your parents. And though I don't think that my videos are at that point yet, um, I think that I've taken a softer approach than what I initially came across. And I think it's part of that natural progression. Um, I try to do my best in using satire strategically rather than using it to hurt people. But that is inevitable that people will take offense to some of what I say and do. And I hope that in the future, there's going to be a newer version of whatever it is that I'm doing that's even more uh, palatable to the masses. And yeah, like you said, it is just the natural progression of it. Let's hope at least that it is the natural progression of it. That's something that I would like to think at least. People like Andrews and McCoy made the difficult decision to tell their truths. Now they're on a mission, spreading the word and pushing for a future where others in the so-called land of the free can express themselves without fear. People have communicated to me that if they were to be public in the way that I am, that they would be kicked out of their homes that they be disowned. I've also had people tell me that watching my videos made them realize that there are other people who think the way that they think and that that's okay. I don't want every religious person to become an atheist. The world wouldn't be better if we were all atheists, but the world would be better if we were all able to critique the beliefs that we were programmed with by our surrounding culture. What do you think of the phrasing of that, spreading the word? It's. Okay, uh, given that they included the context of me saying, I don't think it would be better if everyone was an atheist. Um, so I'm not, I'm not mad at it with that. Uh, Ryan, the journalist, did in our interview ask me if I looked at what I'm doing as a form of ministry. And I said yes, like it, it, in a way it is. My, uh, I'm the first in four generations of men in my family not to be a Christian missionary going out and trying to make converts. And when I said yes, that this is a sort of ministry, I didn't mean to say that the, the point of this is me making converts. It's, that's far from the point. And I was really worried that maybe I could be misconstrued by him keeping that in and not keeping in the part where I said, I don't care if people are atheists or not. I care about people being able to think critically. Uh, but no, that, they did not do me dirty. Uh, it, was, it was all right. It was good. Yeah, I, I think he was just borrowing from uh, religious speak, like spreading the word. Yeah. I relate to a lot of what you said about ex-believers reaching out, telling you how difficult it would be for them to come out or um, the dangers that they're in if they come out and that they feel better knowing that other people like them exist. That's something that I hear on a daily basis. And it's something that I let them say themselves. If they're able to call to my live streams, they actually talk about it and it's very nice to hear it using their own words and their own voice and it feels a lot more real than just hearing from one person other people's stories so i hope that i can use my channel as a hub to spread awareness to spread the word as they say the word here being that we exist and we have our stories and it's not really as rare as many believers would like you to believe I don't think that Al Jazeera would want to shine a light on these stories because they don't paint Islam or the Muslim world in a good light. And unfortunately, it's a lot harder to challenge that narrative in the Muslim world that there's nothing wrong with Islam and that any 
sad stories that you hear are just merely exceptions. But the unfortunate reality is it happens every day. And the more that we can spread awareness of that, the more that we can help those people. And I hope to see news outlets like Al Jazeera cover those stories as well. I saw some comments about people objecting to this kind of reporting at all, saying that Al Jazeera is now supporting atheism or atheists. So even though it didn't mention Islam, there are a lot of Muslims who are upset about this, um, about this kind of coverage, this kind of non-negative coverage about atheism on a platform that they assumed would be sympathetic to their views. And I wanted to thank you for platforming me and by extension, platforming ex-Muslims. I know that it's been on your mind ever since they interviewed you for that piece. And I'm really glad that people like you are helping. Um, and ironically, you might shine a brighter light on us than this video would have if they had included ex-Muslims. So um, I'm very appreciative of that. Hopefully the people who saw this piece and came over to my channel, I've gotten a slight uptick in subscribers since it went you know, live on international TV, see this video and realize that, yes, what the story said is true and it is important, but there's more to it, especially in terms of ex-Muslim experiences. So thank you for being willing to come on and, and talk about that too. Thanks for watching. I've been Drew of Genetically Modified Skeptic. A special thanks to my patrons for their constant love and support. If you want to hear more from me, then subscribe. As always, if you are an apostate from Christianity or Islam that's in need, then there are resources linked in the description to help you find community and mental health support. Remember to be kind to others in the comments, and until next time, stay skeptical.